The first reading this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the time or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John, John uh, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, mother of Jesus, as well his, as his brothers. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for your holy presence here, and we ask that your spirit moves within us so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts are pleasing unto you. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we are the week after Easter, and we are starting a new sermon series, You Shall Be My Witness. So if you think back, if you were here on December 27, I know it's a long time ago now, but that was the Sunday after Christmas, and that was when we started our sermon series going through the entire book of Mark. So congratulations, you survived the book of Mark. But if you remember, we went from Christmas, Jesus being born, to two days later, Jesus was an adult, preaching and proclaiming God's kingdom and calling disciples. And here we are again, last week, Mark left us hanging. The women left the tomb saying nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And our scripture today picks right up at the end of the resurrected Christ time on earth. So before we delve right into the scripture, I'm going to catch you up a little bit. This new sermon series begins with the book of Acts, and it will follow the stories of how Peter and Paul and the disciples shared the good news of Jesus Christ with their world. Now, we're not just skipping, we're not just random, like, what book are we going to pick next? Let's, let's do Acts. There's actually a method to our madness. The book of Acts was written by Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke. That's why the scripture opens up today. He says, in the first book, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught. That first book is Luke. So Acts is actually a sequel to the book of Luke. And Mark, which we just finished, is actually the prequel. Luke was not an eyewitness to the events that he narrates, so he used the Gospel of Mark along with other sources to tell his story. In Acts, Luke seeks to show the community of God's redeeming purpose from the beginning of salvation forward. 
and his overall purpose is theological. He wants to provide an educational narrative to tell stories that will inspire and build up the faith of the community. He places much emphasis on the Holy Spirit, prayer, fulfillment of scripture, and witnessing. So last week, Mark left us in this awkward position. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had gone to Jesus' tomb to anoint his body with spices. But they couldn't find Jesus. Instead, they found a strange man who told them, Jesus has been raised, he's not here. So they went out and fled from the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now verse 3 of our scripture today says, After his suffering, Jesus presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So now the disciples have seen the risen Christ, they've seen the wounds in his hands, and they have come to believe that God's promise has been fulfilled. Besides proving himself to the disciples, Jesus spent time during his final 40 days on earth speaking about the kingdom of God, which is very interesting because if we go back to December 27, Jesus was also preaching about the kingdom of God at the very beginning of his ministry. And the truth is that the kingdom of God was a constant theme in Jesus' preaching during his life and after the resurrection. So let's look a little bit at exactly what Jesus was preaching when he talked about the kingdom of God. He used the Greek term basileia. Be like boy, basileia. I love that word. It has been translated into kingdom, but the problem with that is that it, it conveys an idea of a specific place, of fixed boundaries, where God's basileia is a divine reign and not a kingdom in a territorial sense. In first century Palestinian context, the term Basileia would first call to mind the Roman imperial system, which was a system of domination and exploitation. So Jesus' annunciation of the Basileia of God offered this alternative view to the Roman Empire. The Basileia that Jesus announced was one where there was no more victimization or domination. This Basileia was present in Jesus' healing and liberative practices, in his inclusive table sharing, and in his domination-free relationships. But Jesus' preaching about this Basileia posed a political threat to the Romans. That's why Jesus was crucified because he was challenging the political status quo. So there's no English word that adequately captures everything that Basileia means and signifies. In translating it, we must make sure that we convey this sense of God's saving power over all creation. It began with the incarnation and the ministry of Jesus. It continues in the faithful ministry of the believing community, and it will fully manifest with Jesus' return. Now the part I want to focus on is that middle ground where we are right now, in between the life of Jesus on earth and Jesus' return, the time when the kingdom of God is continued in the faithful ministry of the believing community. That's us, the believing community. Jesus addresses this in verse 8 when he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So there's a lot going on in this statement that Jesus makes, so let's take a minute to unpack that. First and most important, we don't have to do it all by ourselves. Jesus clearly says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now what does that look like? What does it look like when the Holy Spirit comes upon us? Um, my Pentecostal friends would say that that look, that's very emotional. Um, it would be almost like a frenzy. It would be speaking in tongues, 
possibly losing consciousness, dancing in the aisles. I'm sure, however, if, if you guys responded out loud, my United Methodist friends here, you would tell me that you can experience the Holy Spirit quite well just sitting quietly in your seats. And the truth is we all experience the Holy Spirit in different ways. But when we think about how the Holy Spirit is going to help us fulfill our call to be witnesses, we have to think about the Holy Spirit drawing us outward. This is not a time when the, the experience of the Holy Spirit is inward or personal. This is a time when the Holy Spirit is pushing us out. Jesus is pretty specific also when he tells the disciples where they were to witness. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And with that statement, Jesus changed all the rules that they knew. The disciples are to share the good news not only with their Jewish brothers and sisters, but also the Samaritans, and finally with the Gentiles. This good news is not meant just for people who are like us. It's meant for everyone. So now the disciples were in a bit of a quandary. Sharing the story of Jesus in Jerusalem and Judea, that's okay. That's home. That's their comfort zone. That's like us talking about God and Jesus here when we're gathered together on Sunday morning. But Samaria, that was not okay. There was a long history of friction between the people of Samaria. There was an us versus them mentality. Could it really be true that God would offer the saving grace of Jesus to those people? The truth is, the expansiveness of God's promise will take the disciples out of their comfort zone because part of God's promise is that ethnic divides will be overcome. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He pushes the disciples to take this good news to the ends of the earth. For them, Rome was technically the end of the earth. That's all they knew. But we know now that the world, even then, was much bigger than Rome. And so is God's promise. So with this statement, Jesus was including not just his disciples who heard this firsthand, but all future generations who would hear and read this story. That's us. So how do we carry out this command? What does it look like to be a witness for Jesus Christ? What does it look like to embody God's kingdom in our world and we talk about embodying God's kingdom because God's kingdom is here we're not bringing it Jesus brought it we're not waiting on it it's here but we're called to embody that that's our witness Jesus told us that we would receive power from the Holy Spirit so we need to connect with that power and let's look back at our scripture for a little advice. Scripture is always a good place to go when you're not exactly sure what to do. The last two verses tell us that after Jesus had ascended into the heavens, they returned to Jerusalem. And when they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James, all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. So the very first thing they did after Jesus left them, Jesus' closest friends and family, the very first thing they did was to devote themselves to prayer. They spent time talking to God, no doubt asking for guidance from the Holy Spirit. That may have been over 2,000 years ago, but I promise it will still work today. Pray. Spend time with God. Listen. This is how we prepare 
to be sent out. It's not a place to stay. It's a place to be equipped, to be sent out. And you'll find that you'll, you'll be called to share the story of God's grace in the most mundane places and in the most amazing places. So I was in line at the dollar store recently, my favorite store to shop at, because there's not anything in there that I can't afford, right? <laughs> Guilt free. And I, I'm in line waiting to check out, and the line's kind of long, and there's a woman behind me with a couple of kids, and then there's a woman behind her, and all of a sudden, the second woman back turns to the mom, and she says, ma'am, excuse me, do you know Jesus? And in my head, I'm just like, I'm just looking forward, I'm not turning around, and a conversation ensued. And in the end, the woman invited the mom to her church and gave her a little card. So as I'm walking out to my car, I'm like, oh my gosh, what a religious nut. And then I thought, well, that's a little judgmental. Um, and I started to be really ashamed because I thought, oh my gosh, this woman had the courage to share her faith, to talk about Jesus with just a random person at the dollar store. And I wonder how many people had come to know God just because she wasn't afraid to bring it up. So I do admire people who can do that. It's a gift, it's not my gift. You'll, I will never be doing that, I can tell you. I will never ask you to do that. But your witness can be as easy as how you live your life. Because I'm sure most of your friends know that you go to church. Most of your friends know that you're a Christian. So how do you act? How does that translate? Do you walk the walk? Do you tell people you go to church on Sunday morning, but you're um, saying not nice things to the cashier because the line took too long at Food Lion? Are you gracious and loving and kind to people that you encounter? Do you act with the love of Jesus? For people around you? Do you live a life that put, puts God first? Maybe if you're a little more brave, you could offer to pray with somebody if you know that they need it. Maybe you could even invite somebody to church. Other times, I'm going to just warn you, if you pray and if you're serious and you listen to God, God may call you outside your comfort zone. And I, I talked about this at the women's retreat, and somebody asked me, why do we have to leave our comfort zone? Is it not okay to serve God in our comfort zone? It is wonderful to serve God in your comfort zone. But sometimes God calls you outside, because when you're outside your comfort zone, you have to trust God. You have to do something that you can't do by yourself. So my very first mission trip was to Bosnia-Herzegovina. And I knew it was a call from God because I was terrified. I was um, a five-star resort kind of girl. And so going to a war-torn country was way, way outside my comfort zone. I'd never done anything like that. I traveled with UMCOR, which is the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And their policy was that we were to provide whatever assistance we could, but we were not there to convert people. So the people that we were serving were predominantly Muslim. We weren't to try evangelize, we weren't nothing. We were just there to help them. That's what we did. However, our presence and our support was a huge statement to them because the Bosnian War was perpetrated by Christians. So the only Christians they had ever known were Christians who had come into their communities and killed their husbands and sons. Our team was very well received. Um, in fact, I went back, um, I spent two summers there and still have really close friends there. Uh, many other people from the team have gone, I think every year we went in 2000 to start and every year someone from that initial team has gone back in the summer. So some things we did, we counseled women who had survived the war, we helped single moms get back on their feet, we delivered cows and chickens, and we taught them how these things could not only be um, food, but also produce income. We rebuilt kindergartens and any other odd jobs that they needed. But every evening, 
our team gathered on the porch of where we were staying for Bible study every night. We did not outwardly speak about God or Jesus or Christianity. We showed them what real Christians were like. And by the end of our first month there, our Bosnian friends started to join us for Bible study. This is how you witness. This is how you bring God's promise to the ends of the earth. So Jesus has risen from the dead. Now what? Go out and be a witness to the saving grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ. Go out and share the story of God's grace. Let us pray. So go out of here today excited and happy to share the story of God's grace, this amazing story that Jesus came and lived and died and was raised for everybody. Not just people like us, people not like us, to the ends of the earth. Go and share the story of God's grace, knowing that you always go with the blessing of God who is our Father, with the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit present with you always. Amen and amen.